You're listening to their Auto Be a Law, the Center for Auto Safety podcast with Executive Director Michael Brooks, Chief Engineer Fred Perkins, and hosted by me, Anthony Simino. For over 50 years, the Center for Auto Safety has worked to make cars safer. Welcome, oh. everybody. To the Good morning. Of- Yes. Oh, good afternoon, good evening, and whatever else he said in the Truman Show. It's time for another episode of There Ought to Be a Law, and I'll wonder how the automatic artificial intelligent transcription software will write it this week. Isn't that exciting, folks? Hey, so, uh, you know, there's a big thing happened last week, you know, big, big thing. It was so exciting. Changed the world forever. Oh, my God. Put a dent in the universe, even. Elon. I don't even know what to call him. You know, the Elon finally put out his robo-taxi and the world changed forever because it seems that people started realizing, wait a second, this guy's full of shit. This is, what is this crap? He hosted this event on a movie lot and he had robots walking around. That were, sadly, all remote controlled. And, uh, you know, it it made me think back to, you guys remember back in, what, it was 2000, where Honda came out with a robot, the Asimov. And that thing actually walked on its own. It interacted on its own. It wasn't controlled by remote control. And they spent 20 years releasing updates to it. And so Elon comes out and says, hey, here's something that's worse than what Honda did in 2000. And... uh, my friend Kathy Wood over at Ark Investments is like, this is going to be amazing. Everybody's got to own this. Please pump it, that, that stock price up. But I I didn't watch this reveal of the robo garbage. Uh, did either of you watch this this event? I read about it a lot. It was it was past my bedtime at the time it came on. I mean, it was, <laughs> it, was, it, was it was at the proper time for folks who want to sit back and watch a fantasy movie, you know, about 10 p.m. on a weekday. But um, I, you know, I'm sure some of you might might join me in just not wanting to see Elon Musk talk at all. Um, so I didn't really, I I prefer to read versus watch that kind of mess, but you know, it was produced at a Hollywood studio. So was it, was it good, Fred? I know you stayed up late and watched it. Oh yeah. I think I stayed up till six o'clock in the afternoon, I think, but (laughs) no, I, I saw some of the reruns and the reruns were, uh, pretty good. They showed people getting out of a vehicle. That was exciting. Oh, And they showed, uh, they showed a vehicle that looked like an Airstream trailer. That was pretty exciting. With zero road clearance. With zero road clearance, yes. And they, and they showed some smaller vehicles that reaffirmed what we've often said here, which is that in the future, everything will be better. Well, did they did they reveal their new sensors that they're going to be using uh, instead of just their cameras? They're using scent. They- they've 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 got a <laughs> a bloodhound module they've built into it you know we've seen this before actually uh, i'm dating myself i suppose but a long time ago Pratt and whitney came out with a really advanced jet engine and uh general electric came out with something that they called a an unducted fan engine which would have even better efficiency and they used that to successfully suppress sales of the advanced jet engine by Pratt and Whitney until GE had their own advanced system to sell. And then they quietly abandoned their delusional uh, unducted fan engine while Pratt and Whitney sat on the sidelines and suddenly found themselves one generation behind in the technology that they were able to sell. Um, It actually helped Pratt and Whitney to go from 100% of the passenger jet engine air market, uh, airplane market, I should say, to 0% in the same market over a span of some 30 years. So maybe that's what's behind this. I think, you know, the, the idea that in the future everything will be better is great, but there's no substance to it. And uh, clearly Tesla's getting pretty far behind in the technology right now. Their stock price reflects that, and uh, I, you know, maybe people are finally catching up with the delusions here. 
Hey, Elon says this future will increase Tesla's value to $30 trillion, which sounds impressive, but then you realize that's only half of what this podcast is worth in the future. I mean, I've said it, this this podcast is easily a $60 trillion endeavor, right? So well, he's just shooting himself in the foot. When are we going public anyway with us? <laughs> Next <No> week. <laughs> also, when you realize, you know, that that what they're what Tesla's proposing here is a vehicle that has no steering controls or accelerator brake pedals and that's not permitted on US roads without an exemption from NHTSA which limits that to 2500 vehicles. So how are you going to reach those valuations running a fleet of 2500 robo taxis? You're not um, and Tesla hasn't even applied for an exemption of those rules or, or put forth really any type of, of evidence that these vehicles are going to operate safely, which is something they're going to be required to do in order to even qualify for an exemption of 2,500 vehicles from the federal government for these vehicles. So it's the whole thing sounds like a pipe dream to me. I mean, if you're if you're going to, you know, they say they claim that in 2027 they're going to start building these robo taxis and you know that and they're going to be selling them for around thirty thousand dollars which <laughs> you know if you follow tesla at all and you follow the cyber truck you know i believe when they when they started advertising it it, it was going to be fifty thousand dollars and now everyone who reserved a slot theirs ended up paying about double that um i would suggest that you're probably going to see the thirty thousand price of a robo taxi taxi inflate significantly before they ever come to the road, if they ever do. But I mean, there's people who follow this industry much more intensely than we do. And again, I'm going back to my friend Kathy Wood at Ark Investments, and they they tell me this is the future. And for weeks, I've been asking them, "Hey, can you share your research with me?" Can you share your research? And after about a month of asking this, they finally shared where their sources for the research comes from, that they can say, that, hey, the Robotaxi is going to do this and that and the other thing. And and can we take a wild guess of where their, their deep research has come from, where they've dug and got these sources? Fred, do you have any idea? The Daily Show. Oh, no, 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 no. Michael, come not, on, I not, know you know. Not nearly that smart. I, I I, would guess that there's a long list of links from Tesla's website. Bing, 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 we have a winner. Yes, that's because right. That's, that's where they get all their, their crap data they've been spewing for years, too. I mean, they essentially take Tesla's assertions about safety that have never been borne out by actual data that they've been willing to disclose to the public, and they run with it to extreme levels. I mean, essentially... I, I can't tell what ARK Invest is doing, but they sim simply look to me like a, a group that's just pumping Tesla stock until the end. Um, you know, if, if I, I, I think of Tesla almost in the same sense as some of those other stocks like GameStop, GameStop, it's a meme stock. It's really, there's not really a product there. There's a lot of hype and a lot of Kool-Aid and a lot of people trying to make money as the stock rises. But underneath all that and underneath that veil, there's really a company that's, you know, struggling to uh, identify itself in, in the way it has in the past as this innovative um, wonder of a company. Um, you know, they're going to be far behind and already are far behind Waymo and some of the other actual robo taxi companies and you know their technology their full self-driving and their autopilot are, are failing from a safety perspective as as we've discussed ad nauseum over the past couple of years so you know in, in many ways i think this event is not going to change at all and only backs up the perception that there's a lot of smoke and mirrors going on um underneath the hood at tesla well, we're bleeding over into Gaslight Illumination, which this week is a multi-dimensional <laughs> dive into uh, this particular announcement. So I'm going to give my contribution right now. So what I've read, what I wrote here earlier is that this is a desperate and pathetic attempt to pump the stock price where most of his wealth resides by selling vaporware to a gullible public. Uh, Pittsbab, pie in the sky, by and by, to throw shade at other more advanced mobility companies. The uh, stock price is down 18% from its pre-announcement peak, and it's down 40% from its all-time peak. So perhaps the stock market's finally waking up from its future value delusions of Tesla. 
uh, you know, a vast multiple of the valuation for other car companies that produce far more cars. I I, I think you're on to something there. Michael, do you have a do you want to contribute your take on Gaslight this week? My guy, well, I mean, I think we we are. I, I don't think there's any question that we would probably all agree that Elon Musk is the the king of gaslighting. Um, I don't know if we've seen someone who's done it quite as effectively in recent history in America. Um, but I, I, if I had one gaslight from the whole uh, cyber tech cyber taxi or whatever robo taxi event. Is when um, you know someone posed a question around you know aren't you putting you know Uber and Lyft drivers out of work you know and 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 you know he he described you know it was described in broad terms a future where people who drive for Uber and Lyft would one day oversee a flock of cyber cabs that they take care of like a shepherd, um, which <laughs> you know I, I, it's. It's. I don't know if I even have to say anything further on that, other than you know, good luck buying those sheep to all of those you know Uber and Lyft drivers out there who are going to you know have be forced to buy a fleet of robo taxis in order to to uh, continue their operation and to continue to you know make a living. Um, it's just another you know uh, sleight of the hand by by Tesla and by Musk to you know it, it, pretend that they are looking out for other people and in fact um but you know anyway it's never going to happen so i don't think those uber and lyft folks have too much to worry about from tesla i think they might have more to worry about from some of the more established um av companies that are you know actually putting safety into their systems yeah but I, i'm going to follow up on what you just said michael about you know, people, the sheep buying the sheep actually is what yeah. he's proposing. But this is a new model of capitalism that has come out and it's uh, enabled by computers everywhere, right? So what we're seeing in with Uber, for example, well, let me back up. In the old days, capitalism worked by people borrowing money and getting investments to build a factory, and then people would come and work in the factory, and so you'd have a clean break between capital and the workers, right? So what we're seeing now with Uber and its astronomical capitalization and Airbnb and a lot of the other gig economy stocks is that what they're really doing is they're forcing the workers to capitalize their own workspace. And uh, you know that's why they've got such a, a huge valuation, because they're a capital free capitalism right they're not they're no longer financing the means of production and what they're doing now is they're forcing the workers to finance the means of production and they're only providing a communication vehicle for the workers to try to extract value from the capital that they themselves are providing this is uh, you know this is the sub agenda that's going on here uh, worldwide and nationwide and what elon is trying to do is to tap into that for his own financial benefit i don't think he's going to do that but i think you know our listeners need to be aware of this transition of capitalism from its traditional mode of you know people using capital to build assets to instead force the workers to finance their own so we're really slipping into a classic example of socialism where people own the own means of production except that all the profits are being siphoned off to go to a third party it's a it's a really weird transition we're going through and it seems to be unremarked by most people mm. wait a second all three of us work from home wait are we we're paying for our own are we so unionized union all right i'm not gonna do that uh i saw my I'm going to do my gaslight's going to be a little different. You guys both went chose Elon. I'm choosing the enablers of Elon. That's right. The dumb media, the dumb Kathy Woods, people like that who are like, whatever he says is great. And specifically, I'm going to call out Deutsche Bank. <laughs> uh, aren't they best known for uh, laundering money for drug dealers? Was that Deutsche Bank? I don't know. I think I can't remember that. If it yeah. was that or, you know, protecting uh, World War II illegally seized monies and, and artworks. I'm not sure. Well, <laughs> they also financed uh, orange-flavored uh, politicians when nobody else would. 
Well, anyway, they're as a highly reputable bank. Uh, they estimated that robo taxis could bring Tesla an additional four billion in sales and another one billion in pre-tax earnings by 2030. Uh, the RBC, I guess, is the Royal Bank or something or other, uh, pegged the total global revenue for robo taxis at one point seven trillion dollars by 2040. One point seven trillion dollars, ladies and gentlemen. In 2023, Uber, which operates around the globe, generated $37.2 billion in revenue. So, uh, huh? I mean, I'm not the greatest mathematician in the world, but they're saying in what? In 15 years, this market is suddenly going to uh, multiply a lot, a lot, a lot. I mean, really, there's that kind of growth in taxi services? Yeah, I think we're going to need a lot more people. Yeah. And, uh... So that's that's it. So we got two votes for Elon, one vote for the Elon enablers. And the winner is the Elon enablers because we've hit up Elon too much. But, hey, let's continue with our with our, our talk of Tesla and all things. Wait a minute, but Wait, before uh, we do it. lost. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, go on. I'm sorry. Before we do it, shouldn't we have some kind of prize that we give to our winners for Gaslight Illumination? A, a Piggly Wiggly shopping cart or something? I used my Piggly Wiggly shopping bag two days ago. Loved it. It was great. They are nice. I like it very much. Okay. Uh, yeah, you can send me whatever you'd like because I chose the winner and I chose myself. Well, I think we should create our own uh, NFT for the podcast with our faces on it and send, a, send one to everybody. Oh, I like well, that idea. And then we might make some, a, a non-fungible, fungible token or whatever they call those things. Gentlemen, we've gone so far off the deep end here. Look. We have. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk Cybertruck, okay? Um, there's one in my neighborhood I see parked, and every now and then I'm like, I want to get a, a chair and just sit outside it and just see who the owner is. And be like, <laughs> woohoo, look at you go. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Wired, we're linking to an article from there, uh, talks about the Cybertruck and Euro NCAP, which is the new car assessment program. Quoting from the article, Based only on the car's visual appearance, there are several aspects of this vehicle that look like they may be a threat to pedestrians, claims Euro NCAP's director of strategic development, Matthew Avery. You cannot fail Euro NCAP, he adds, but you can get a bad score. Um, and further in the article, <laughs> still, it takes a particular kind of customer to buy a car knowing it has a low star safety rating for the occupants and potential Mad Max style lethality to those outside the vehicle. The kind of customer who would buy a Cybertruck. This is a brutal takedown. Like, I'm I'm jealous of how well they did this. You know, the, the, what 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 actually happened here, I believe, was there was there was a guy in the Czech Republic that wanted to import and register Cybertruck and ran into a lot of problems with the European Union's um, pedestrian protection um regulations and with the NCAP that that has the pedestrian testing for for safety scores um and so the the vehicle couldn't be certified under european regulations apparently the czech authorities allowed the vehicle to be registered but they required the vehicle to have little rubber bumpers put around the vehicle on all of the seams on all of those sharp edges um that in the Czech authorities' minds apparently prevented um, pedestrian inju injuries and made the vehicle um, work under the EU law. I don't think that the EU is going to go along with that. I think they're probably going to resist certifying the Cybertruck based on their regulations. But, um, you know, one there's one now one Cybertruck in Europe is the, is the outcome of, of, of that. And it has weather stripping, so it's ready for winter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Cybertruck, because you hate the world. Uh, but you know you love the Center for Auto Safety, so go to autosafety.org and click on that donate button. Tell you all your friends. Send a link. Pause. Pull over to the side of the road right now. Relax. Enjoy the dulcet tones of this podcast and call up your friends. Be like, hey, what are you doing? Oh, I'm listening to the Center for Auto Safety podcast. Oh, yeah. Get help. No, that's not what your friends would say. They'd say, hey, can I donate too? And you'd be like, yeah. But let's yeah, there's a, There was something else that was interesting in that article. I'll just go back to you real Please. quick. Um, 
In order to drive um, a vehicle weighing over about 7,700 pounds in Europe, you're required to have a um, what they call a Category C license, which I believe is, is functionally equivalent to a commercial driver's license in the United States. So essentially, if any of these giant pickups that we've seen come out of the roads lately, many of them weigh over that amount. In America, if we had that, you know, the people buying them would have to have a commercial driver's license, which is a, a really interesting thing. I know it, it it shows, I think, that European authorities have their eye on the ball a little more than we do in the United States when it comes to vehicle weights and the people operating those vehicles. Anyway, I digress. I just noticed that in the article. Okay. Hey, let's move on to something fun. Well, I don't know if it's fun, but the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, uh, they have a new article out talking about how automakers have moved quickly to install louder, more persistent seatbelt reminders since IIHS began rating this, that feature in 2022. The first year, only 17% of new models earned a good rating, while 65% were rated marginal and poor. But manufacturers have already flipped those numbers. 62% of the 2024 models tested so far are rated good. Only 24% are rated marginal or poor. I love this because this is the fact that, hey, IIHS can go out there and shame automakers into making their cars safer. Yeah. I don't see any downsides to this. I think this is great and no, good it's, for it's, IHS. It's great. And then, you know, I guess the only negative here is that NHTSA isn't doing this work through its NCAP program. I mean, this is what the NCAP program was designed to do was to punish the poor safety performers out of the manufacturers by giving them bad ratings, thereby potentially driving their sales down, which, you know, is an incentive for all the manufacturers to continually be upgrading the safety systems in their vehicles. Um, NHTSA has struggled to implement um, new technology into the NCAP testing. IHS is, you know, unburdened by a lot of the um, requirements that government agencies have to deal with when when putting programs into effect, you know, has moved forward in a lot of these areas where NHTSA hasn't been able to. And, you know, in this, this is also an area, seatbelt reminders, where um, there is a requirement that NHTSA, that we've spoken about before on the podcast, you know, that NHTSA has this rear seatbelt reminder rule that it's been struggling to put in place now for many years. Um, and and you know, we've kind of reached the point where that is coming in the next few years and manufacturers are catching up, going ahead and implementing that into their systems. Um, and so that's I, I would guess that that's part of the reason that we see this much higher this shift uh, in the last two years in, in the Insurance Institute's testing is because manufacturers are it's not just uh, just because they're testing for it. It's also because manufacturers are preparing for this regulation that's soon to come into effect for rear seatbelt reminders. So um, but the most interesting part to me in the article was that it, it found that, you know, what really matters with seatbelt reminders is a sustained audible alert. It's got to be obnoxious in order to get people to buckle their seatbelts if they've forgotten. I, I believe, you know, the federal government requires something like a six to eight second audio uh, audible uh, reminder and then a visual reminder that stays on your dashboard for a certain amount of time. Um, the insurance institutes tests uh, require or, or give better scores to vehicles that have the longer audible alerts because it, it showed that the longer audible alert um, was a, was equivalent to things like, you know, not letting the vehicle speed up over 15 miles per hour um, if you don't have a seatbelt on. I mean, that's which is a very, you know, a, a pretty rigid punishment. Essentially, that would require people driving somewhere to put their seatbelts on. Um, so audible reminders appear to work and they appear to work great. And, you know, now it's time to get them into the back seat. I, I love that. Wait, did you say it was IHS that said that the vehicle can't accelerate more than 15 miles per hour? So they had they had a study about the reminders um, and, and they found that the persistent audible reminder, you know, the 90 second of just totally right. annoying reminder was just as effective as putting a speed limiting interlock oh, on the vehicle it. that kept the vehicle speed under 15 miles per hour unless the driver buckled up. So um, which shows you, you know, that's 
shows you just how effective the audible reminders can be if if they're just as effective as essentially preventing a trip over 15 miles per hour. Right. Who's not wearing their seatbelt these days? Come on, people. Buckle up already. It's not that bad. Um, so what, you said uh, Nitz has been working on this. And just remind listeners, why? what's the delay? Is this politics or is there something else going on? Yeah, I, I, it's it's politics. I mean, there's been a requirement for NHTSA to put a rear put re, to to force manufacturers to put rear seatbelt reminders into vehicles for well over a decade now, um, and it just for whatever reason uh, we have a hard time even identifying why it's been so slow. Um, we went to court to try to force it to move faster seven years ago, um, and it's it's just progressed at the speed of sludge and it's it's and, and it's a relatively simple rulemaking um you know you're you're essentially we've already got seatbelt reminders in the driver's seat often in the passenger seat and they're fairly simple uh mechanisms they're simply detecting whether a seat belt is buckled um so it's 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 really kind of shocking that it's taken them so long to get get these into place and it, it is because of resistance by the manufacturers um but it's also because you know we had four years with essentially a, a non-functioning rulemaking department over at NHTSA um during the previous administration and you know it's it but it's a it, it it also makes me concerned that when we get to more complex problems like we're talking about with Tesla or self-driving vehicles and the regulatory efforts that need to be made there. You know, if you can't get a seatbelt buzzer into vehicles that covers the back seat, you know, how, and you can't get a regulation out requiring that, how are you going to get a regulation out ensuring the safety of automated vehicles or overseeing the implementation of vehicle to everything technology? Um, so it raises questions about rulemaking competency. Well, that's why we exist to help pressure these things. Another aspect of this is that we as a population have gotten complacent about the idea that 40,000 people a year are dying on the highways. Uh, get snow, right? When was the last time you saw an article in the New York Times headlining uh, the fact that 40,000 people, a good-sized city, are dying every year? This is, this is craziness. And, you know... I'm not, I don't know what you, people need to do to recognize that this is absolute carnage on the highway. That's half a million people every 12 or 13 years. I mean, there's a lot of people dying out there. There are some very simple measures that can be taken to dramatically reduce the carnage on the highways. And it's astonishing that not only is the government not doing anything to do that uh, to support those safety measures, but also the people just don't seem to care. It's, I don't know if that's a function of advertising and people are captivated by, you know, SUVs driving on dusty roads with commercials and, you know, all of the pickup truck commercials on the football, uh, in the football games, but something strange is going on. I just, I don't get it. Maybe we should run TV ads where it's your SUV and it's bright and shiny and it's, you know, backing out over your kids. The guy keeps going, cracks open a beer, keeps going, doesn't have his seatbelt on. Woohoo! And just show him killing a bunch of people over and over again. Well, the cigarette yeah. companies are forced to put warning labels on packages of cigarettes. Why isn't there something comparable for automobiles? The comparable numbers of people are dying every year. I don't uh -huh. get it. You know, I mean, technically, the controls on a vehicle are now capable of alerting people to many safety critical situations attached to seatbelts, yes, but also on the highways and driving too fast and approaching curves and you know all those sort of things that, that kill people are within the realm of what computers in these cars could be warning people of. Uh, don't understand why there's no imperative to take advantage of that for the sake of saving people's lives rather than just making people take their damn hands off the wheel. I don't know. And that's what keeps getting pushed as well. The car will just drive itself. And uh, that's happening now with uh, 18 wheelers, I guess this would be. So um, 
related to this. There's a company, Gaddock AI. And Gaddock is, am I pronouncing that right? Gaddock, they, uh, they work on autonomous transportation technology for basically 18 wheelers, large vehicles. And they've come out and said that, hey, we are committed to not launching a driverless operations until its systems satisfy a rigorous examination by independent third parties. Uh, edge case, edge case research, uh, friends of the show, and Tuv Sud, some European company because it's got umlauts, were brought on to provide that outside perspective and validate its development and safety process. So here's a company outside of government regulation is trying to at least take safety seriously. Um, is is this advertising? Is this a real deal? What's uh, what's your take, Mr. Perkins? Oh, your take is muted, but it was definitely well-intentioned because he leaned in. He got all earnest. So far, it's a good news story because uh, this third-party evaluation is something we've been advocating for a long time. And we participated in development of UL4600 in a minor role, but... We are certainly behind the idea that UL4600 or its equivalent should be used to provide independent third-party validation of the safety of self-driving vehicles, including, of course, uh, the heavy trucks, maybe especially heavy trucks because of the enormous amount of kinetic energy they've got. So uh, we'll see how it plays out, but so far it's a good news story. All right. I'd like to hear that. Uh, a less good news story... <laughs> well, actually, I don't know if it's a less good news story, to tell you the truth. So we've talked a lot in the past about V2X, which is vehicle to everything. So your vehicle on the streets and and road traffic, everything's connected. So it gets uh, your vehicle can have a better understanding of what's happening on the road. Hey, traffic slow down ahead or hey, there's a speed limit change or lane closed or ice up ahead, something like that. I, I know you two probably have better examples, but that's what I'm coming out. This hasn't really been deployed. Um, it's very, very early stages, but the University of Michigan has said, hey, uh, we got to protect these when this comes out. We got to protect it from hacking. And I love the fact, just like we're doing with autonomous vehicles, is they're getting ahead of the curve and being like this stuff can be hacked uh, from an article we're linking to. Uh, while prior studies focused on individual sensor security or simpler collaboration models, uh, this study introduces sophisticated real-time attacks tested both in rigorous virtual simulations and real-world scenarios at their test facility. Um, and they the researchers administered falsified LIDAR-based data uh, that appears realistic to the system but contains malicious modifications via, via physical access to the hardware and software. They used zero-delay attack scheduling, a high-risk cyber attack that uses precise timing to introduce malicious data without lag or delay. Uh, in virtual simulated scenarios, the attacks were highly effective with success rates at 86% on road attacks on three vehicles in the environment triggered collisions and hard brakes. Now, this is great, I think, because, again, this these systems are not deployed anywhere in the world yet, but they will be at some date in the future. And you got to start putting in, hey, this is all the holes in the system. These are all the potential problems. These are all fixable problems, or at least ones that can be addressed in some way. Yeah, and look, Frank, I mean, they actually are deployed in in the city of Ann Arbor, where where a lot of this uh, testing is going on. So oh, they've yeah. got they've got um, you know curve speed warnings. They've got intersection broadcasting is what they call it. It's basically a V2X module, an intersection that can communicate to vehicles approaching that intersection. Um, they've got pedestrian uh, and, and other types of V2X systems. I think they have a couple or hundred of these systems deployed throughout Ann Arbor that they're studying this on. And they're finding that, you know, they're pretty easily hackable and pretty easy to send false data across these networks and which is going to confuse vehicles and could cause safety issues, could cause crashes. Um, so, you know, like everything uh, that's connected, um, V2X is going to have to get a, a, a robust cybersecurity plan Um either by regulation or by, you know, the companies voluntarily deploying one that works. 
before we start to see the spread of, of V2X. And we're looking at, you know, V2X, there's kind of a long horizon on because we're not even, you know, we were delayed by the um, FCC spectrum issue with the wireless V2X. They've moved on to um, a connected system that's based on uh, telematics and, you know, uh, data. And so it's going to be a while before we start seeing the, the good things that come out of V2X. A lot of cars aren't, most cars aren't equipped with any type of V2X now. So it's it's a long way into the future. So in this respect, we have time to go ahead and set up a robust cyber system that, you know, by the time this technology starts to percolate out, out onto our roads, we can get these false detection rates and other problems that were that came through in this study uh, taken care of. Yeah. And unlike what the tech bros spout about self-driving vehicles and whatnot, this is actually something that will make a huge difference. And it's not phantom and fiction and even something that the robo taxis would actually require to make them more safe and more effective. Uh, I need to point fan. out, though, that this is one specific kind of attack where somebody has physical access to the software and hardware. So they got right. into the cars and introduced some, uh, you know, uh, malicious software. So it's great that they did this, but nobody should think that this means that the cybersecurity problems associated with software driven vehicles have been solved in any case. <laughs> great to alert people, but, uh, you know, we're a long way from a cyber safe future i mean you don't even need physical access with over the air software updates someone just needs to compromise that server sending that data out and can put something in all yes. right you can also put messages into uh, billboards for example that only the lidar could read or only the cameras could read oh um, like there's uh, there's an, an infinite number an infinite universe essentially of software hacks that could defeat or attack the cyber systems of uh, connected vehicles. But if we start attacking this stuff now, solving these problems now, ideally, in the next decade, we'll be more prepared. Oh, look at that. Pre-planning. Isn't that a wonderful idea for safety? I think it is. No, it's also a good, wonderful idea for safety. Go to autosafety.org, click on donate. Okay, let's go into the Tao of Fred. And today... Fred is going to climb into his BattleBot costume and have humans versus machines. Begin! You've now <laughs> entered the Dow Well, good morning. Uh, again, <laughs> still morning, right? So, Who knows? <laughs> I, I've just been kind of sitting back thinking globally about this sort of stuff, and I've come to the conclusion that we now live in a world in which an international cabal is building and fielding malevolent machines financed by remote murky corporations and by involuntary tributes from the populations they endanger. Machines that are beyond human control, roaming the streets at will, randomly frightening, injuring, and killing pedestrians and motorists with impunity from control by police or the judicial system, all at the behest of ignorant and corrupt public officials, immune to protests from the people most at risk, with no clear advantages for the affected populations. This sounds like the plot of a science fiction movie, but this is actually what the people in San Francisco and Los Angeles and uh, I guess Austin, Texas, and a few other places are encountering. <clears throat> uh, the, but the band plays on, and an army of well-paid lobbyists are spreading this plague across this nation and other nations. So how did we get here? No, well, I I read the Constitution, and there's no language in the Constitution that I've read conferring rights to machines that are senior to human rights. Yet that seems to be what we're encountering here. The machines can go ahead and kill people, and there's really no recourse for the people who've been killed uh, through the legal system, right? Because they may have signed some disclaimer somewhere. Um, uh, Michael, what do you think about that? I mean, there's, uh, are there, do machines have rights? Well, I mean, I would suggest that the machines produced by uh, corporations, you know, do get a benefit of, you know, do get to 
the benefit of the corporate personhood that that corporation has been granted under some, you know, various misguided interpretations of the Constitution by the Supreme Court. Um, but when it comes down to it, um, I think you can see how that's happening on the ground in San Francisco, where large corporations are coming in. They're, you know, politicians, Democrat or Republican, love the the idea of economic growth, of providing jobs for their citizenry, of bringing companies into their cities, and oftentimes sweetening the deal with tax breaks and other things that the rest of us are never going to get. Um, so yes, I mean, I think you know corporations and their machines do have certain rights, you know, because they lobby for them um, that that your average human might not have. And and in some circumstances, you know, I think it's quite fair to say that corporations have more rights than 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 your average human walk around the street. Well, Kobe, yes, but but the machines. I'm specifically talking about the machines, right? Machines. So this is this is a, a bizarre world in which we're fueling machines that have no rights, but they are actually being treated as though their rights to operate are superior to the human rights. Now, there's a, a common good that everybody has by virtue of their being born, right? Which is the ability to walk around safely or to exist safely. Um, you know, this is not the first time that industrialists have exploited a common good for their own private interest. And, I, and my position is that the ability to walk down the road safely or to operate safely is a, is a common good. <clears throat> Too many businesses uh, continue to pollute the environment in support of their own, in pursuit of their own profits. And, and that's really what we're looking at here. The pollution of the public safety environment. Too many businesses force workers into unsafe conditions as the price of their continued existence. Look at Uber, right? Look at look at uh, Musk delusions about where these uh, cyber taxis are going to go. <clears throat> Too many businesses continue to introduce unsafe devices into commerce or profit from laws that specifically ex based on laws that specifically excuse them from the lethal consequences of the product they sell the gun industry, the tobacco industry, and now the AV industry. And this is the happy situation that AV developers are busily creating for themselves at the public's expense. Uh, and the public really has seen no benefit from these technologies. Yeah, there are, you know, there are people talking about in the future, everything will be better. But to date, there's been no demonstration of, of any benefit. And in fact, if these companies are going to get anything like the kind of profits they're pursuing, it's going to make transportation and safety on the highways much more expensive for everybody so that they can achieve their profit objectives. <clears throat> so I, my question is, do we need new constitutional amendments assuring the primacy of human rights over machine rights? Uh, we, you know, we, we need to stop sliding into this abyss without thinking about it. Somehow, the citizens have got, have got to regain control of public spaces from the capitalists who seek to capture its value and sell it back to us one credit card transaction at a time. And technology development is fine and dandy, but technology development at the expense of our legal rights and abandonment of liberal democratic ideals cannot go unchallenged. Um, end of rant. <laughs> Look, I, I mean... Fred, guns don't kill people. My machine gun robot kills people, okay? And it gets away with it. It's the perfect criminal. I call it GM Cruz. I'm with you. Yeah, um, that's the thing we've talked about. With a lot of these AVs, they're exempt from traffic laws. They have passes, like in San Francisco. They won't get tickets, right? I spoke to a cop in New York City. I was like, with a robo taxi, like, what do you do with a robo car? He's like, yeah, we have no idea who you give. Who do you give the ticket to? How do you pull it over? I mean, I think they've kind of figured out how to pull it over, but who's getting the ticket? Like when that Waymo ran into a traffic into a, a, a light pole in Arizona, like who gets the ticket? Who gets even if the even if you do give a ticket to the company, how does that affect the individual behavior of the machine that just killed somebody? Right. Uh, it, so it doesn't. It has no impact. So, you know, this this legal system is not up to this challenge. 
Well, it seems like, Michael, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems a lot of these jurisdictions like San Francisco and Phoenix and Austin are giving these companies just kind of waivers to commit traffic violations at a minimum. Yeah, I mean, depending on the state and most states really right now don't have a lot of regulations around the, the autonomous technology. So you're, you know, it's the Wild West out there. Um, and as we've seen with, um, you know, the Uber and some of the situations that happen there, if, you know, if you're in one of these vehicles and something bad happens to you or if one runs over you and you happen to run, runs over you and you happen to have agreed to a um, terms and conditions document by clicking on your cell phone screen at some point, you may not even have the ability to avail yourself of the civil justice system and take them to court. So there's there are protections, you know, beyond the, the original protection that all the, the, the people that are building these technologies have, which is you know, their corporations and, you know, the, the people behind that corporation are somewhat shielded from liability. They are adding additional layers of liability on top of that in, in the form of um, arbitration clauses and, you know, in the form of lobbying uh, city and state leaders for perks and for things that the average uh, individual is not going to qualify for. So, there's there are a lot more protections for for the machine in that respect, I believe, than there are for for humans. Yeah, and again, the, the the key is that there is a public good which is freely available to everybody, which is the right of the integrity of your body when you're not infringing on the this freedom or safety of other people. And you know that has value, and what these companies are doing is they're trying to capture that value and sell it back to us. This is this is madness. Uh, we cannot continue sleepwalking into this. I'm on board. So let's let's have a scenario here. So I lend Fred my car, and then Fred goes out and runs over a bunch of people. Now Fred's going to get arrested. I'm not going to get arrested, right? Because I didn't do it. I mean, sure, it's my car, but Fred's going to jail. Right, right. Unless you, unless I happen to be drunk when you did it. Yeah, uh, there's well, a number of there's there are a number of ways there. Depending on you know if you knew there was a problem with your vehicle, I mean there are a lot of ways you could get roped into that situation. So what I'm what I'm getting at, I guess, is so when software engineers and hardware engineers they produce something that winds up killing somebody, um, why do they get away with it? Why do the executives come? I think back to Volkswagen Dieselgate, where at folk, first Volkswagen was like, it was just one lone programmer. No, it was, it was the entire company, and they got fined billions and billions of dollars. Um, why isn't there? And that was just for cheating on emissions. Well, there's, you know, it's just, it's it's very difficult to get to. I mean, that's functionally the whole purpose of a corporation is to shield uh employees from the law and to put the you know basically hold the corporation out as liable for any acts or emissions by its employees so um that's a basic function of the law is protecting employees from that kind of thing i mean you have you you, you have to see really outrageous behavior by executives before you see anyone going to jail i mean frankly the volkswagen example that you gave is is the example of what needs to happen more often but in fact rarely happens which is you know seeing corporate act bad actors and corporations actually go and serve prison time for doing bad things most of the time the company pays a fine which often isn't enough and people walk away scot-free um, and don't have to take any accountability for their actions other than maybe a hit to their retirement or their bonus for that year. Um, so that's a big part of the problem. So, so far, the corporation has succeeded in insulating, uh, well, not insulating, I should say isolating people who live in communities where these are operating from the ability of regulating the vehicles, right? So they've gone to the yep. state governments to make sure that the people most affected have no impact on the safe operation of these vehicles. I'm sure, well, I don't know, I'm projecting, but I imagine if if we were somehow successful at the state level of putting authority uh, where it belongs onto the programmers and developers, that they would then focus more on the federal level. They haven't been able to do this at the federal level yet, but you know there is a whole army of lobbyists out there who are very effective uh, working at the state levels to make sure 
that every state has the same level of autonomy for developers that we now see in Texas, Oklahoma, and California. Hey, Michael Moore, this is the idea for your next documentary. It's an update to Roger and me. It's called Robot and Me. Um, end of rant. That's not rant. That was a suggestion. I, I just want, I don't even need a cut of the proceeds. Like a nice t-shirt would be cool. Yeah, uh, I think an official rant has got to travel over a couple of paragraphs. So I, yeah. That, yeah it can't know. be just one sentence. Well, I, I, that's I didn't a quip. rant. That, that, that's a quip. <laughs> no, man, it was a pitch. It was a, my my pitch idea to, to Michael Moore. I don't even know if he still makes movies, but it was for him to uh, go ahead and uh, go to the Auto Center for Auto Safety and click on Donate. You guys ever wonder what happens to cars in the U.S. when they get crashed and get mangled in an accident? You ever wonder? Yes. Well, they wind up yes. in Europe. <laughs> uh, we have an article from the BBC, um, or for those of you who are uh, more local, the Beeb. Uh, quoting one of the largest car park parks in the former Russian state or former Soviet state of Georgia is owned by Caucus Caucus's Auto Import, a company that buys used cars from auctions in the U.S. The vehicles have been so badly damaged in accidents that they've, they've been written off by American insurance firms. That's right. Your car is totaled, but they'll still buy it in the lovely state of Georgia. Well, not a state, the country of Georgia. The state of Georgia is just like, I don't think so. Uh, this is uh, scary, and it makes me glad that I don't buy used cars in the former Soviet republics. Yeah, I like, I like the part about where they say, well, it, it takes so long to get them fixed in, the, in America that, you know, it's not economical. We fix them much faster and cheaper. Uh, they don't talk about the quality. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, this isn't just a, a, a Georgia and, and former Russia Republic thing. I mean, our, the vehicles that are crashed in America that Americans are no longer willing to use go all over the world in, in, in very, very large numbers. And one thing that happens on their way is they're, they're functionally stripped of a lot of the emissions and safety equipment that's required in america but not required in those other countries so you're essentially you're seeing a lot of um you know catalytic converters are going to be stripped before they're sold in a country with no emissions because the catalytic converters and the the, the rare metals that make up the catalytic converter and parts of it are are more valuable here um and so you what you essentially are doing is passing on vehicles to countries without any safety or emission standards and we're essentially offshoring our own problems you know if if i think there was a figure floating around that in some countries at like 95 or higher percent of the um vehicles that are purchased in certain countries are used vehicles coming from elsewhere um and so essentially what we're what we're allowing through this export of bad vehicles in the United States is shipping our bad emissions and our bad safety problems off to other countries. Um, so it's it's something that I think that um, I it, you know the United States should look at restricting. I believe the European Union is also looking at restricting this because essentially we're you know cleaning up our own house, saying that you know we're we're able to. Um, raise the number of EVs in our country while at the same time sending a lot of vehicles offshore to countries where we're essentially delaying their adoption of vehicles with better emissions and better safety technology um, to a later date. So um, it's a it's a it's a bad practice and something that everyone should be aware of. Okay, well, with that, I think it's time for some recalls. Um, I'm not sure all of these cars that were crashed in the U.S. and sold overseas were recalled, but that's not how things work. Let's start off with Honda. Honda recalls nearly 1.7 million vehicles. Oh, my God, for steering problems that could lead to crashes. What is happening here, Michael? This is something we've seen a lot of complaints on. NHTSA had an investigation that announced earlier this year Um a lot of civic drivers, but this also goes beyond civics to, I think, Acura Integra's 
uh, the CRVs and the HRVs um, from 20 th 2022 to 2025. Um, NHTSA opened this investigation into complaints that fault steering was sticking while they were driving and they were having to overcome that by using uh, a lot of effort, you know, not uh, non-usual steering effort, I guess I would describe it as, in order to actually turn the wheel. Um, and so about six months into this investigation, I I'm assuming NHTSA was putting the screws to Honda behind the scenes saying, you know, you need to do a recall here. Um, Honda has announced the recall, so owners can expect to see, I think they're going to, um, let me see, I think they're going to re replace or inspect and replace the steering gearbox assembly as part of this recall. So owners should be looking out for that in the next couple of months when they're notified. Get it fixed, listeners. Next up, Nissan, uh, 37,236 vehicles. This is the 2024 to 2025 Nissan Rogues. Uh, and certain Infiniti QX80s. And this is, oh, no, is this a, this is, is this a rear view monitor? I, oh my God. It's always yeah, a rear yeah, view. No? It's, it's yet another rear view camera system that's running through an inf infotainment system and is encountering interference and not producing the proper image when when required, when someone's reversing. So it's a problem. It's something we think that needs to be taken care of. I, I think what ultimately needs to happen is the safety components need to be able to override all infotainment functions of the vehicle uh, whenever they're required. We continue to see problems with the interface between infotainment and safety equipment in electronics, and something needs to be fixed there. There needs to be some type of regulation that assures that safety features are going to um, be able to operate regardless of what an infotainment system is doing or whether the infotainment system has the proper software. Um, yes. Safety features need to take priority. Yes, there needs to be a, a separation of church and state there because yeah. this is way too common, we see. Uh, last recall, BMW, 11,579 vehicles. The 2023 to BMW XI Drive 28i. Look, if you're going to spend that much Just, money on a car, yeah. like, why? I mean, come on. Like, I want to pay for something. I mean, and this just continues with all of these ridiculous X something, blah, 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 yeah. blah. Uh, brake module is issue. Yeah, not only that, it's, it's, there was a recall that was issued, I think around February, that, um, it, it basically screws around with the, um, analog brake system, stability control, you, you're still able to stop the vehicle, but you know, when you, when you encounter situations in which you need stability control or analog brakes, it, there's, it's not functioning properly. Um, they put out a recall for this in February and found out pretty quickly that that recall was not actually going to fix the problem. It was not working. And so they had to go back and now are conducting this new recall um, to fix the problem they thought they had fixed before. So that's going. That, it looks like they're replacing the integrated brake module with a different brake module entirely. Um, and owners of all these num number and letter vehicles made by BMW can expect to hear from them late in November. All right, that's uh, that's it. We there's some investigations. We're not going to get into those right now, but uh, you know, more review cameras. I'm sure that will be a yeah. call in the future. Uh, but for now, thank you so much for listening, listening listeners. <laughs> oh God! Uh, and uh, till next time. Ciao. All right, thank you. Bye bye. Thanks everybody. For more information, visit www.autosafety.org.